All right, guys, we are officially starting a couple minutes early. I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Max Ramirez. I'm a professor here at NBC, and my passion is digital marketing. Uh, I also manage the new BIT Center, that's Business Innovation and Technology. So if you haven't taken a tour of that, we literally have senators and congressmen and CEOs coming in, uh, seeing what we're doing here, and I invite you. It's at Wilson Campus. So today we have a, a great speaker on a hot topic. So let me formally uh, introduce him by telling you about him. His name is Alberto Mujica, which I had practiced, and he's the managing partner at Scale Up Legal. He helps startups navigate through all the legalities necessary to protect, capitalize, and scale up a startup. See the connection there, scale up? All right, so he specializes in international corporate data privacy and intellectual property law. And those, those are, to me, in my opinion, three separate webinars to come. Alberto has recently helped a company called Coach Hub, a German startup currently valued over 1 billion, so yes, a unicorn, raised more than $300 million. So immediately in the back of my mind is, Alberto, how did you do it? What did you do? How, what did you say to make this happen? Alberto has been working with tech startups for more than 20 years and holds not one, not two, but five degrees. And just for fun, let me tell you about them. He has a BS in computer information systems and business administration from Florida Tech, a Juris Doctor in international and civil law from NSU, a master's in data science from NSU, an LLB from the University of Barcelona. So yes, he's a, a lawyer here and in Spain and a LLM from UC Berkeley in intellectual property technology, including blockchain and law. So a big round of applause and a red carpet welcome to Alberto. Let me bring him in front of the camera. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. The floor is yours. I'll be monitoring the chat room for your questions, by the way. Thank you. So um, welcome everybody online and welcome to all of you here. Uh, like I've said before, um, this, this presentation is gonna be modeled on uh, my, my office hours that I have with several accelerators and uh, incubators. So uh, if you have any questions, bring them up. Uh, Max will make sure I get to hear them and uh, I'll address them. And same to you, stop me if you have a question. What I'll, what I'll do is if you ask a question, I'll repeat it here so that people online can hear it. And uh, then I'll try to answer. So with that, uh, let's get started. Um, so, Lawyers, we got to make sure we disclaim nothing here is legal advice. And all of these uh, trademarks and copyrights belong to us. And uh, let's get into the subject. So, but actually, important note. Um, first, I have to thank Chechu and uh, Max and the Bid Center. And I encourage everybody to visit the Bit, the Bit Center because it's awesome. And um, and obviously MDC. So um, why would you want to set up an entity? Uh, those of you out there that are considering starting a business um, and those of you that are walking in, welcome. Uh, if you're interested in starting a business, the first thing you want to do is set up an entity. Um, Back in the days, it was quite common for people to open up a, <clears throat> a store or whatever and have and own the store outright personally and run their business as a sole proprietorship. Problem with that is liability. So why do you want to set up an entity? You want to differentiate your personal life from your business life and limit your liability. If someone sues your bakery, you don't want them to be able to come after your house, your car, your kid's college fund. So that's the top reason to create an entity. And it's also the um, 
So this is something that was created by, by the state. It's an idea to encourage people to get into business. Uh, the entity was created so that you could limit your liability. Limiting your liability is about protecting your assets, including assets that you know you may assign to that to that business that you own, you know, patents, trademarks, buildings that you may own, etc. Reduce taxes. Another reason to create an entity. In uh, when you have an entity, you're able to take the cost of doing business them from your revenue. No, I think that personally. What does that mean? The sound is not working well. I can hear him. Uh, we, we can hear you guys. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you hear him perfectly. Max and Eva. No, no, I mean, we can hear you guys. Can you hear him? We can hear you. Let me see if I can. Okay. There we go. So, um, so I'm sorry. Apparently, there are uh, problems with the sound, but now they're okay. Okay, cool, great. So, reduce taxes. Um, so that's one of the other advantages of having an entity. And finally, attract investment. Because um, with an entity, you can split up your business and have people own fractions of your business and also own fractions of the future revenue generated by that business. So those are the main reasons why you want to set up an entity when you're starting a business. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second. Any questions? So essentially, why would... Uh... Alberto, would you mind please repeating that question? Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Um, yeah, um, we'll, we'll actually go deeper into that in a second. But but uh, his question was, what is uh, you know the difference in attracting investment in a sole proprietorship versus an LLC? Am I right? Yes. Did I? Okay. So that's going to depend on the, the type of entity. Uh, in fact, an LLC is not the very best type of entity to attract investment, uh, but we'll go over that uh, right now. So um, the types of entities. LLCs do not have shares. They have participation. They have members instead of shareholders. And... Uh, Although, you know, in, in, in businesses where you have even very large businesses can be LLCs, but in LLCs um, have, the, I'll tell you the, the ma major pros, and there's an S falling from the cons, you know, <laughs> so, so um, one, one of the, one of the, the big pros is that, you know, it, you get passed through taxation. In other words, any revenue that makes it to the company as it's distributed to the partners or owners or members, then they get taxed on that. Versus other entities, as you'll see with uh, corporations, they get taxed first, and then the individual shareholders get taxed on the income that they make. So one of the issues, you can't go public. You can't register an LLC to go public and sell shares because it doesn't have shares. That's one of the issues with LLCs. LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. So it limits your liability. You still get the advantage of having uh, an entity far better than having than function, uh, running your business as a sole proprietorship. Um, so you get the advantages of the entity but there's different kinds of entities. So we'll go over those. Uh, and it, like I said, it's not the preferred type of entity for investors. So if, you're, if your goal is to attract investors, an LLC may not be the best option for you. But one of the other, and I, I, 
one of the major advantages of the LLC, it's really flexible to, to manage. A, an LLC functions under what's called an operating agreement versus corporations which run under bylaws. It's very flexible. You can adjust how you want your, your entity to function. You can adjust how the different members um, uh, get to make decisions. It's a very flexible structure versus uh, corporations which function under a very rigid number of rules, including, uh, including the rules set out by the state. So S-corporation, I'm gonna mention the top three types of entities. So an S-corporation is just like a corporation, but it has the advantage of receiving pass-through taxation. In other words, the entity is not taxed first and then the shareholders again, all right? Any revenue that comes into the company and then distributed to the partners or the shareholders, they get taxed only on what they ultimately receive. The corporation doesn't get taxed. That's one of the advantages, but welcome. Um, but it does have limitations. In order to get that advantage, <clears throat> they have a limited, uh, you can only have one class of shares. And ultimately, when you want investors, investors are going to want uh, preferred shares, class A, class B, et cetera. These shares, uh, you can't have this these differences in an S corp. So it's still limiting. And um, you can only have a limited number of shareholders. And therefore, because of all these reasons, it's not the preferred entity if you're looking to uh, raise capital or attract investment. C-Corp is the opposite of everything I just said. Uh, you can have any number of shares. You can have uh, shareholders that are anywhere in the world. Um, it can be a registered uh, company and you can go public on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and therefore, it's very attractive to investors because uh, they can structure the investments any ways they want. They can bring additional investors. But the problem is the corporation has to pay tax and then any distributions the shareholders have to pay tax. So you get that double taxation. So any questions on this online here? Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Your name? Lilia. Lilia. So Lilia was asking, uh, what do I mean by going public and I'll, I'll explain. Going public doesn't mean that you can't sell to the public your product or service. What, what, what I'm talking about is the shares. Uh, a public company or a registered security is a, a company whose shares are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or the, you know, in any one of the exchanges where they can sell stock. So that's what I mean. Um, when I say go public or not go public, you know, so does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Taxes vary, like it's different if the tax that is for an LLC than for an S corp, for example, like the percentage of the tax. Okay. <laughs> Taxes are a whole world, right? <laughs> But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to clarify. Whatever taxes, as, as an LLC or an S corp, you are personally going to be taxed a certain rate, a certain way, based on your jurisdiction, on your income, based on all of these things. Now, um, this is simply going to be an additional part of that taxing structure, whatever it is. If you're in California, it's gonna be different than if you're in Florida, in Texas or Delaware or whatever, right? Each one, and it's gonna be different if you're making $100,000 a year or $10 million a year, right? So whatever that is, 
this simply states that you, whatever income came into the LLC that corresponds to you as a partner or member, or from the S Corp as a shareholder, whatever income you get there gets treated, gets only taxed there when it arrives in your, when, when you have it. Um, in the C Corp, same thing, right? It, it depends on the jurisdiction. It depends on how much revenue it makes. It depends on its costs. It depends on a million things. But whatever it is, the corporation gets taxed, right? Has to pay its own taxes as a, as a person. And then whatever returns the shareholders get, they have to pay their own taxes on that. So that's the double taxation. I think uh, someone else raised their hand. No? All right, cool. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about the states. I'm going to speak first about Florida because that's where we are. Um, actually, you know what? I forgot to mention one other thing. The type of business really that you're looking to uh, put into an LLC might be a very successful business, but it's typically going to be something maybe smaller uh, that where you're not looking for an investment. Let's say a bakery or even uh, many, many of these subsidiaries of larger C corporations are LLCs. So just that it's an, because it's an LLC doesn't mean that it, it's very limited. It's just useful in terms of uh, simplifying uh, the operation and also in, um, in consolidating or, or reducing the tax liability. So uh, Alberto, we have a quick question from our Zoom audience. Isabel Ruiz has a great question. Is C Corporation better to be incorporated in Miami or in Delaware in your opinion, which is better for a startup? Great question. Um, and I will answer that right now uh, <laughs> as part of the presentation. All right, That's actually a, a very common question. And, um, but I'll get to the Delaware after we address Florida first, uh, because actually Florida is a great jurisdiction for corporations. It's, it's not bad, it's, it's low cost. All of you are here, uh, low taxes, um, and you don't need a registered agent because you're here, you know. Uh, but when you're dealing with uh, large institutional investors, they might not know or understand and therefore might be a little more concerned about investing in a company that's incorporated in Florida. So that's the biggest issue. If you're looking for investors, sure. They might not understand that Florida law is actually very similar to Delaware law. Because uh, the, the, the law of corporate entities is state by state. And that's why you'll have so many situations where, you know, all these banks and these large institutions are all in Delaware. And you, you'll notice that, right? Um, but uh, but but the fact is, Florida law is actually quite similar to Delaware law. It's actually very good corporate law. So, um, but of course, the next most important uh, jurisdiction for everyone else is Delaware. Um, why is Delaware so famous, and why does everybody incorporate in Delaware? thing is, it's a state that has dedicated itself to making effective law and effective institutions to deal with large corporate structures. They have any, any jurisprudence coming out of Delaware is highly influential in the rest of the country uh, in court. Um, <clears throat> They have dedicated courts only for corporate issues. Uh, they have low taxes when it comes to, especially when it comes to the transfer of uh, intellectual property. And 
everybody knows Delaware law. So it's attractive to investors. Investors feel comfortable saying, I'm going to invest in a Delaware corporation where I know where I've invested in a hundred other companies or 10 other companies or whatever it is. I've already done it because everybody keeps doing it. It's sort of that network effect, right? Uh, but it is more expensive, a little bit more expensive, and uh, you're going to need a registered agent. So it's not that big a deal. But uh, but if you're looking for investors uh, and you're looking to sell um, shares of your company, you really should uh, consider a Delaware Corporation. Well, of course, there's lots of other states, Montana, Nevada, uh, New York, uh, California that come to mind when it comes to incorporating. Each one of those has their, have their, you know, their advantages, disadvantages, some are more private, some uh, have, have better taxes and uh, those benefits and those uh, cons, which, you know, that S is driving me crazy. <laughs> um, uh, vary significantly between states. So, I mean, for most of you and most most of you that are listening online as well, your choices really are going to be either Florida or Delaware. And it's really going to boil down to your, um, your desire to attract investors. So, with that in mind, any questions about the different states and why you would incorporate in one versus other? Did I answer that uh, online question there, uh, Max? Um, I think you did. Yes. Cool. We're good. All right. Um, so uh, with that, one of the big things about having a corporation or an entity is to protect your assets. What assets does a small or a startup uh, company have? Typically, it's going to be intellectual property. It's gonna be either a patent, copyright, or a trademark. And I'll go into the differences uh, of, of those, um, but why, why even protect them, right? So first of all, it's, it's an enforceable exclusive right. Uh, um, I, I presume everybody here has heard about NFTs. So you you get you get a copyright. You know you you buy something. Technically, you get a copyright. But make sure NFT stands for non fungible token. Yes, yes. Um, which which just means uh, it's uh, for those of you uh, that aren't aware, NFT stands for non fungible token, and it is. Uh, a token issued on the blockchain or on a blockchain that is not equal to all the other tokens minted on that blockchain necessarily. So versus Bitcoin, every Bitcoin or ETH minted is equal to every other Bitcoin or ETH minted. Anyways, so, so you get... Um, an enforceable and an exclusive right. What well, means exclusive? Exclusive means you can exclude others from that property. That that be it your your uh, book, your song, your uh, the use of your Coca Cola brand, um, or the manufacturer of some device that you've invented. What's really great about IP assets is that they're very scalable. Uh, some of the greatest uh, uh, commercial empires have built their fortunes on these types of assets. We can all think of Disney. Right, with their copyrighted movies, songs, characters, etc. Uh, Coca-Cola with their trademark Coca-Cola brand, 
that they have managed to put on pretty much everything, right? Uh, from soft drinks to t-shirts and everything else. Um, and uh, patents where, you know, even if you've invented something and you don't have the capacity to maybe manufacture it yourself, you're able to license that right to someone else to either import it, manufacture it, or whatever you need to monetize uh, that patent. So they're really great assets because they're very scalable. Uh, low taxes. Intellectual property, if managed properly, um, Max, are you trying to say something? Uh, I'm waiting, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the um, the I'm I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, you know uh, that Apple right now and Facebook are based out of Ireland, and everybody has heard of Grand Cayman um, entities and all of these. Well, the good thing about intellectual property assets is that they are easy to transfer. I can say, I can create an entity, let's say in Grand Cayman, sell my intellectual property asset to, to uh, the entity in Cayman, and that entity charges my US entity for the use of that intellectual property. And that is a legal way to move your profits to another jurisdiction where you can you'll have a lower tax burden all right i'll chime in now so uh okay. just to be clear for myself and for our, our audience when someone works with you to create an llc that does not infer that their business has copyrights, trademarks, et cetera. Is that correct? Absolutely. That, that, those are two very different things. You can you form um, an LLC or a corporation and um, that, that gives you the things that I listed before, limited liability, uh, the ability to write off uh, your costs, to lower your taxes, all of these other things that I mentioned before. But it's a separate process to attain a patent to, uh, and I'll go into those uh, in a minute about how easy it is to get one versus the other. Uh, but in general, uh, they're completely separate. You may, you may have a corporation called whatever, uh, and uh, that doesn't give you a right to use that name as a trademark. That doesn't automatically give you a trademark. So... But, I, but I'll go into that in about a second. Um, so we're going to start talking about patents here. Um, unless anybody has any questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I've um, been reading about intellectual property is that there's such things called like um, derivative works or you know, you can say you can so you see the movie Star Wars, right? And you want to create something, but it's not Star Wars, say so you're really interested in like the clone troopers, and you want to create your own movie, maybe you take that clone trooper. You know, to what extent can someone, you know, take you know part of someone else's idea or or you know get character structure or maybe an algorithm? But to what extent can they take that and create something like completely new that's just theirs? So I think the line on that sometimes is a little gray. Not important because I feel like in general, our business, you know, get inspire each other. And sometimes I think people think, well, this person already did this, and I can't do that at all because probably interfering on their IP. But maybe you can take, you know, uh, maybe a small portion or, or an idea from that and create your own work. So can you just talk a little bit about, um, about creating your own work, maybe based on ideas from other years? Can you do that? I will. Let's uh let's I I'll I'll give you a whole section on copyright and we'll talk about derivative works there. But uh in general, uh he was asking right now about uh derivative works and to what extent you're allowed to create your own works from existing works. And and we'll address that in a second. Um 
unless anyone has any additional questions concerning why to why protect your IP or anything to that effect. Okay. So we'll start we'll start talking about patents. There's often uh entrepreneurs, I really want to get back to that that question for you. <laughs> um uh often people uh, misunderstand what a patent versus a trademark or a copyright is. I'm going to try to give you a summary of the differences. And uh, we're going to start with uh, patents. Um, so patents protect inventions. Uh, they protect not an idea, not a thought. They protect. You have to actually have something created that works and solves a problem in a new way that isn't obvious. There's a lot of conditions in that, in that sentence, you know? It has to be new. It has to actually solve something. You have to have invented it, okay? And it can't be obvious. Um, so that's the big, the, the big, those are the big requirements of an invention. But once you get a patent, the protection is very, very solid. It gives you that exclusive right and it's very solid for 20 years. Nobody can import, make, um, um, even develop independently. Let's say you invented, I don't know, let's say uh, TV. the TV. <laughs> even if another inventor in their own cave invented the TV independently, if you own the patent to make TVs, they still can't make TVs because you have a monopoly for 20 years for the uh, importation, manufacturing, uh, and sale of TVs in the United States. It's super solid. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very solid right, <clears throat> but it's hard to get. It's hard to get. It, the examiners are very thorough. There's, it's a high bar to get that. It's also the most expensive uh, type of intellectual property uh, protection you can get. And it's also the shortest. You got 20 years, but it's a solid monopoly on that. After 20 years, anybody can make your TV, you know? And that's what you see how drugs, after a long time, suddenly they drop in price and their generic versions. That's what that happens. That's what happens. Their 20 years are up. Now, generic makers of the drug can make it. Versus copyright. Copyrights are works of authorship. They're really the easiest to get. Um, uh, books, movies, music, and their derivative works. <laughs> so the thing about uh, copyrights is that they are automatically protected. You write your paper, you, you, uh, you, uh, you record your song, um, you make your movie. As soon as what you made is put onto a medium, it's yours. You don't need to register it. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to take it to the copyright office. You don't need to do anything. Of course, if your business is based on the sale of this very scalable asset, it's a good idea to get it registered. And there's reasons for that. You're, you're, you're capable of getting uh, statutory damages. There's lots of reasons why to register them, but I didn't register this, this presentation and it is still mine. I have a copyright over this presentation and I didn't register it. So, but the, the copyright protection is not, uh, oh, but it's very long, right? You get, this presentation is protected until 70 years after I die. So life plus 70 years. 
it's long, long protection. Um, Disney and uh, and uh, uh, Warner Brothers and uh, HBO and these guys, the Netflix, they get this copyright for these incredible productions for the lifetime of the alpha plus 70 years. So it's a long time. Now, um, of course, when you have a valuable copyrighted asset, you really want to register it with the copyright office because of other benefits. Now, when it comes to derivative works, it's one of the most contested things in this, even to the Supreme Court, right? Um, there is a clear, and in, uh, in your example, you mentioned somebody that wants to make a movie about stormtroopers alone. The, the courts have found that there is a character is copyrightable if he has been defined well enough by the author, uh, which limits your ability to make a derivative work based on a stormtrooper because the character was created by that the original author. So there's limits. If if someone just has a dog in a in a uh, in a in a movie and it's just an extra, and you make a whole derivative work based on that dog that didn't speak a line, didn't have personality, then you're probably safe. But uh, but it depends on the character. Sure. So, so you know, we know the stormtroopers as like they're killers, they're enforcers. You know, what if someone wants to make a movie about a stormtrooper as a as a sentient being, as a, as a lover, as a as a child or something like completely different? You know, it changes totally changes the stormtrooper on its head. What about what about that? I mean, wasn't that wasn't that uh, episode nine? I think that was episode well, nine. They scary. did that. <laughs> the stormtrooper that rebelled. Uh, re rebelled. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, the, the Star Wars franchise is so strong. Um, um, it is a gray area. Clearly, it's a gray area, but also it's... Um, meaning that that it's very fact specific right uh whether there's an infringement or not but uh but i mean in in the particular case about stormtroopers that's such a strong franchise and um disney is likely to fight it you know all the way so <laughs> um but this brings us to the one of the issues with copyright protection you're not protected against independent development. If you write your poem, make your movie, write your book, and someone else in a cave somewhere writes the same exact book, the same exact movie, and they can show that they did not copy yours, they can... They, 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 they are not infringing your copyright. So you're not protected against independent development. And of course, there's no such thing as a perfect exact copy, but very similar copies or, or, in, or um, it happens a lot with music, right? Um, someone will come up with a song and it's, it'll be a great song, it'll be a big hit. And then someone else independently with no, without keeping this or the, the other song in mind, comes up with a similar tune. As long as they can prove that they did not copy it, they are, um, they are protected. They are not infringing. So, so uh, the bottom line is you get long protection, but it's not that hard to overcome the protection. If you, if you, make a story about a mouse, you know, depends on how much that mouse looks like Mickey Mouse, uh, you're still able to write a story about a mouse, so. Alberto, <clears throat> uh, I'm taking notes as you're speaking and uh, I just wanna understand that I'm understanding correctly. So you said, I create something that's an original piece of content. Right. 
I don't need to see a lawyer because when I present it on a medium, you said you use the word medium by default, it's already copyrighted or that's where I'm confused. Um, yes, you automatically, once you put your work of authorship on a medium, let's say you record it, you put it on your hard drive, uh, you, uh, you put it on film. I post it in social media. Even if you don't post it in social media, you created it before posting it in social media. The moment you created it, you have a copyright to that. And if Even someone replicates it in its original form, I can take them to court. Yes. The problem is, the problem is, keep in mind that um, if, because you didn't register it, this is taking your example, if you didn't register it, then your 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 damages are different than if you had registered it. Also, your damages will be based on, well, what is uh, what what how how unique is this thing that someone copied? Uh, how much uh, revenue did you lose because of that infringement? So, but yes, technically you can you can take them to court. It is an infringement. If somebody copies something that you didn't want them to copy that you created, even if you didn't register it. I, I have to tell a quick little story. Sure. All right. So I wanted a nice background for my LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn picture, but I wanted a nice background. So I went to Google and I saw a beautiful picture of Miami. I downloaded it, put it up on my LinkedIn. I had it up there for about a year. I get an email to my inbox. I am the photographer. Uh, here's the court number. I'm taking you to court. You used my picture. And I, you know, I settled these things out of court, $5,000. I'm going, oh my God, you know, stress level went up. Uh, and then I did some research on this photographer and through blogs, et cetera, he has lists. He does this for a living. He yeah. puts beautiful pictures up, wanting people to use them. Then maybe he has a, a, a data tag or something. He finds these pictures, sends them, and the courts already know him. The courts know him by name. He brings his lawyer. He brings you know, the defendants in, and he sues them, and he's got all the rights, or he settles out of court for five to 10 grand. So right. it happened to me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh... If the, uh, you, I don't know if he registered that picture or, or, or other pictures that he sues for, but uh, he doesn't need to register them in order to own that copyright and have that right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> don't, use, don't use stuff you find. Live and learn, live and learn. Live and learn. <laughs> Pay attention to Alberto, people. Pay attention to Alberto. In terms of safety, uh, if you have a manuscript, if you place it in a globe, they look to yourself. So it's post dated, and you don't open it. And then you say, wait a minute, let my notice someone, like a year later, someone's copying my story or whatever. And you're able to that, that the date who wrote it was a year earlier. Well, that suffice when it comes to court protection. Now, I mean, that's that's an uh, I don't want to say urban myth, but but yeah, that's possible. I, I mean, the more evidence you have, the better. Uh, uh, nowadays, that would be a bit of evidence. Um, uh, but yeah, you, you, you don't need to do that to have the copyright. Right. Uh, as soon as you make it, you have the copyright. Um, if, Right, uh, right. Like I said, uh, if 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 you need to provide evidence, typically there's enough meta information on your file to prove that it was created at such and such time on such and such computer, and and that's often enough. Um, but but yeah, that's an an additional uh, piece of evidence, a uh, postmark date on a sealed envelope. That's that's not invalid. It it, it could come in and. Um, and uh, 
prove the at least the earliest provable date that it was created yeah so so um any more questions on that yeah go ahead it could be long too so. <laughs> Um, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, infringement on intellectual property uh, is. I, I would say, and I don't have, you know, exact numbers or anything like that. I would say happens more often in Europe. Um, in the the U.S. has developed a, a pretty good culture about respecting intellectual property rights. Uh, the enforcement is is common and and it works well. Um, in Europe, it does too. But it, but uh, Europe in general is not as uh, litigious a society as the US is. And, um, but it, when it comes to the rest of the world, uh, Russia, China, um, and in general, the rest of the world is less concerned about intellectual property rights in comparison to the US. Uh, but it's, but, it, but, it, but the idea of protecting intellectual, uh, intellectual property rights uh, Across the world is gaining traction, and more and more countries are protecting it and enforcing their intellectual property laws uh, more carefully. Uh, uh, Europe is good in general, um, uh, but Australia is also very good. Uh, 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 Japan, and and what you'll see is in those countries where the intellectual property rights are enforced. You'll see a, a lot of people investing in technology, investing in in works of authorship, you know, video games, et cetera, um, because they 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 feel that they'll be compensated fairly for for their work and their investment in these things. So, um, yeah, did I did I answer you? Any more questions? Um, so this is easily the US, right? Yes. Right? For example, I write a song. Should I copyright or license the song in the US and in Europe like a different country? Yes. 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 But uh in most most modern countries, including Europe, you already have copies. Okay, well, specifically when it comes to a song, you already have copyright. Remember, you don't patent that, you copyright that, right? So song, um, you already get a, a copyright because it's yours, you made it, it's yours, and and you automatically get copyright. Do you want to register it? Probably. Uh, if, if, uh, if, you, if you register the copyright, <clears throat> you're entitled to statutory damages uh, only after you after you've registered. So if someone starts an infringement, right, you can you can stop them. You can't stop them even before you register. Uh, but the damages that you're going to get are not going to be uh, as that big um, as if you had registered. So so I recommend registering, but. But in most modern jurisdictions, um, patents, patents are more complicated. Yes, and uh, uh, but but there are protocols to to allow you to take your invention, patent it internationally, and get the effective date. Dated back to when to the, the the effective date here, so there are ways. It's still more expensive. It's still more work, but 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 if you have a market, let's say in Europe or or elsewhere, it, it makes sense for you to to take your patent internationally. Yeah, but it is it's very much jurisdiction by jurisdiction. 
you know? Yes. Out of breath, okay, out of my own uh, greediness that you're here, I have to ask this question and go anywhere you want with this question, but on the topic of chat GPT and these artificial intelligence platforms, you know, coming up every day, oh, I prompted it to do this and I created this amazing piece of art. Oh, I asked it this question and chat GPT gave me this answer. So it's my answer because I prompted it through chat GPT. Is all this stuff defendable, even though it comes from artificial intelligence? <clears throat> the honest answer is, I don't know. Oh, okay. I hate to say that, but I don't know. Uh, and, and it's still to be decided, I think. Uh, a lot of these things this is so new that it hasn't been challenged in court yet. Um, I would say uh, that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make your question even more complex. How about, because chat GPT or the, the, the uh, GPT LLM, um, uh, OpenAI is the company. Uh, it's GPT generative uh, something or the other. I don't remember right now, uh, technology. Uh, LLM is a large language model. So, so that's the technology, but um, for example, um, uh, the Google version, Bard, 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 Bard is, is also an LLM. But, but anyways, the fact is these things also feed on their answers. So it gives you an answer and then it reads its own answer and it becomes part of its large language model. So the question is then the next answer, uh, who owns the first answer? Was it an infringement? Uh, <laughs> lots of this stuff has not been decided and, uh, and it makes for interesting uh, jurisprudence. I, I look forward to it, you know, but, uh, but it, it hasn't been decided. Uh, I, here's another example that, that we've been, you know, playing games with, uh, is that that particular case uh, that that similar to that case, someone makes a you know, how was it? Uh, there's this uh, Swedish DJ prompted GPT to write a song in the likeness of Justin Bieber or something like that, and it came out. Yeah, who owns that? Um, he decided not to use it to make sure that he didn't infringe on. Is a style something copyrightable? That's debatable. A character is. <laughs> yeah. Alberto, I've got a great question from our Zoom audience. Nestor Bonilla, great question. Regarding patents, uh, do I have to register domestically and then internationally? Yes, absolutely. It's jurisdiction by jurisdiction. There's a there's a Madrid protocol which uh, allows you to to um, backdate the effective date of your patent, but you got to go out there and get it done one by one. And is that the same also for copyrights? If you're protected here, are you protected overseas? No, not necessarily. It depends on the jurisdiction, and I don't know all jurisdictions, so this is a, a, a broad question, but. Uh, in many jurisdictions and many modern jurisdictions, you automatically have copyright, uh, just like you do here when you first create your, your work of authorship, but, uh, but you get additional benefits if you register the copyright in that jurisdiction. So if you know, if you're, uh, let's say you make a movie here, it's in French, and uh, you think that the movie is gonna be a big hit in, uh, French speaking countries, you might want to register the copyright in those places uh, where it's more likely that infringement will, occur, infringement, infringement will occur. Did I answer that? Yes, you did. I, I quick little comment from Nicole Garcia. Oh, <laughs> oh, interesting. And I think that goes for all of us. So um, our online audience uh, questions are blowing up. If you own a website, that contains a blog, how can I protect my content? If you uh, can, I don't know if you can. No, you can, of course. Even uh, if it's published, it's yours. 
it's it, it, even if it's published or if your blog you wrote that blog um you don't need to register it it's yours you you you, you have a copyright to that to that blog that you created you said so that you seven, seven times i guess it's just kind of like out of fear we almost can't believe it <laughs> but I know. I it. <laughs> it's, often, it's often the case that you know uh People are surprised that you don't need to register it, but yeah, it's 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 yours. You have a copyright to what you create, um, which that that's that's why these intellectual property rights are important for your business because these are the things that keep your competitors out, right? These are the things that create that moat around your business so you can succeed, right? It's it's the that that's the exclusivity part. Only I can sell this. And when it comes to copyrights, a book, a movie, a song, infinitely scalable. That's why investors are attracted to intellectual property assets. They're scalable. They're easy to sell, make once, sell a gazillion times, right? Super scalable. Um, and they are, at least in the US and in most modern jurisdictions, you have an enforceable right to keep others from selling your stuff. And that makes for a good business. So what, what, does a, what does an investor look, you know? Do you have a patent? Do you have something that only you can make for the next 20 years? That's awesome. I wanna invest in that. I want a piece of that action. You know, you have a copyright, you have a song. If it's popular, I mean, you can sell it an infinite number of times at zero, at zero cost, basically. So it's extremely scalable and enforceable, right? And you can sell that song until you're dead plus 70 years. That's really good. Um, and then there's a network effect, right? That's that's the final type of uh well there's others but the, the three major ones right um trademarks trademarks identify products or services or the makers of these products or services uh often you'll you'll hear someone i want to trademark my book and no you got a copyright a book you know but you want to trademark your brand right that's the other thing that investors look for they look for these monopolies and they look for traction. If your business has traction, the network effect, right? Uh, where, where you've garnered you, enough of an audience uh, or enough buyers, like in uh, you know, Coca-Cola, right? People will only buy Coca-Cola. Uh, you don't want someone out there saying that they're making Coca-Cola when they're not. And most importantly, when they're not paying you as the owner of Coca-Cola. So that's traction. And that's the other thing that an investor will look for. They are looking, for, if you've got traction, you really need to make sure that you trademark your brand and that you are defended. Because the trademark, unlike the other ones, has no time limit. You can own your trademark for as long as it's in use in commerce. So it's not 20 years, it's not lifetime plus 70, it's as long as you're using it in commerce, that's where you get the right to protect your brand. So- Alberto, I hope you're having fun. Um, I've got a great question from Isabel. Sure. If you hire a freelancer to write code, would you need a freelancer to sign a document to release intellectual property? What a great question. Uh, ideally, when you hire a freelancer, before he starts even working, uh, you need to make sure you have an assignment uh, of IP clause in your agreement. Uh, because conditioned on payment, of course. Uh, but that's what's called a work for hire. The, the person actually making it does not own the copyright. You own it because you paid for it to be made. 
It's the same thing as, uh, you know, how many um, artists Disney employs uh, or, or, or freelancers. And the only thing is you got to make sure that if you're hiring someone, you include these these protections for the copy uh, the the intellectual property that they're developing for you uh and make sure that it becomes yours uh once you pay uh, i've actually seen horror stories where this hasn't been the case and it's been for software so somebody uh, uh there was a, a startup um that hired uh a cto the cto was essentially a programmer so he started working on developing the app. The app started getting traction. They were doing really well. Uh, they were attracting investors. And suddenly the CTO figured, well, this is just mine. And there was no IP assignment clause. There was no work for hire. There's none of these things were in, um, <clears throat> in place. And, uh, you know, the, the, the CTO was able to essentially blackmail uh, the owner and uh, they decided to, you know, redevelop the app. Uh, so at, at, at a very, uh, at a lot of, at, 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 a, at a big cost. So like you were saying, that once they the pay, it's, you know, it's understood that it's still theirs. But unless there's like an agreement, then maybe they could go to court and say, well, you agree with this, you agree with that. Technically, it's still, even without the agreement, if you hire somebody to do something, it's still yours, whoever hired the person. Absolutely. Just without the agreement, you know, they can maybe do whatever. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's still theirs. And they could go to court. But probably going to court is going to cost them more than just redeveloping the app. So that's what they, what they decided to do. It still costs them a lot. It, it delayed them a whole lot. And, uh, and it almost resulted in them having to close their company. But, um, but yeah, these things are important that you get this done. Um, these are the protections that, that, that matter. I mean, you, you've, you've put your heart and soul as a founder uh, into your company. You've, you've spent a lot of money. You paid this guy to develop this thing. And then, you know, he's holding you at knife point. Uh, for you to pay more so yeah i got a quick question by a round of applause do you feel like you learned something today right. all right i'm seeing myself in the bit i hope you had a good oh i loved it i loved it, I loved it. Yeah, yeah yeah. i almost feel like we're just getting started so i'm um, we would obviously love to have you back obviously you're a busy person but it's been an hour yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you no thank it's, you it's my pleasure thank us. you so much uh uh, and uh, if you need anything or you're 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 curious, you're welcome to send me a message and uh, let's link up on LinkedIn and and uh, best of luck. Uh, I had seen. I, I thought we were done. <laughs> uh, you know. Anyway, so best of luck to all of you. Thank, thank you, guys. and thank you, man. Thank everybody. I love you. Awesome.